Hello and welcome to the Beyond Biotech podcast number 13. And if you suffer from Triskaidekaphobia, then maybe wait for next week's podcast. Actually, don't do that. We've got another great lineup of guests on a variety of subjects. So if you do have a fear of the number 13, then let's just call it 12B. I'm Jim Cornell from The Biotech, and I had never been bothered in the least by the number 13 until one Friday the 13th, about 10 or 12 years ago when I was running an aquarium in Canada, and we had just closed at 5pm, all the staff had gone home, and we heard a terrible noise, and one of the biggest tanks had broken open. So there was just me and my assistant, and within seconds the ground floor was about a metre deep in water. Needless to say, lots of phone calls later, and also lots of work, we just got cleaned up in time to open at 9am the next morning. But we don't have 13 guests on the podcast today, which is going out on September the 9th. Today is Stand Up to Cancer Day, something an awful lot of companies in the biotech space are doing. So if you're listening, and you're one of them, thank you for all the work that you're doing. It's also a public holiday today in Myanmar, so I suspect not many people listening there today. Maybe there never are, but it's good to have something to blame if the numbers are low. It's been a wet week here, so I can say that pretty much nothing has happened. Maybe that's a good thing, although clearly the big news here in the UK this week has been the passing of Queen Elizabeth, the only monarch most of us have ever known. It feels a little bit surreal here today. It's a truly historic and sad event. Time is certainly flying, and it's now just a couple of weeks to NLS days in Sweden, so I'm starting to think about that. When you travel every month, it becomes a bit of a routine. Now I'm having to remember all the things I take with me, and it's definitely a worry that I'm going to forget something. So let's get down to this week's podcast. This week's guests are Bobby Sony, Chief Business Officer at the Bio Innovation Institute, and Harriet Edwards. International Association of Science, Parks, Media and Community Manager. And we also have our weekly spot with global commercial real estate services company JLL. And this week it's with Travis McCready. Now it's time for the news we've had over the past seven days at labiotech.eu. It was a little quiet on Monday thanks to Labor Day in North America, but did it ever pick up? Yesterday, I have never seen so many press releases and so much news coming in. We still haven't caught up. And so, here are just some of the many headlines from the past week. Avacta's drug targeting soft tissue sarcoma was granted orphan drug designation by the FDA. Synergen is going to collaborate on a study of patients hospitalized due to respiratory viruses. And Astellas said it is encouraged by menopause symptom treatment results in China. Benchling has launched a solution to boost mRNA and RNA therapeutics development. Alzanova announced a new positive safety review for its Alzheimer's study, and Litex Biopharma is expanding its advanced melanoma study to Europe. We had an article on a research discovery that may make COVID boosters obsolete. A drug from Ticomed inhibits infection of human cells by dengue, Zika and yellow fever viruses, and I'll be interviewing them about that later today. And Finnish researchers have used machine learning to unlock the genomic code of clinical cancer samples. 4C Foods created eel meat using organoid technology. An investment of 130 million euros has been made by Millipore Sigma for life-saving therapies. And the first patient has been dosed in a Chinese trial with a drug to treat non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Stratosphere is overcoming the viral immunotherapy delivery bottleneck, Integral Molecular joined the FDA's iStand program, and Lutris Pharma says its radiation trial showed positive results for breast cancer patients. A report looks at the future of clinical trials. We had our monthly look at the biggest private biotech investments in August, and you can read all of these and a whole lot more at labiotech.eu. I have to say that the response to our new conferences and events listings page has been great. I've received lots of emails with events to add, so please do keep those coming. Some people have also said it's a great resource, so thank you for that positive feedback. So let's get this week's interviews underway. 
The Bioinnovation Institute, or BII, is an international commercial non-profit foundation based in Denmark which incubates and accelerates life science research. It's been busy of late adding lots of companies to its programs, so to tell us more about what it does and some of the companies it helps is Bobby Sony, Chief Business Officer at the Bioinnovation Institute. Hi Bobby, can you fill us in on what the Bioinnovation Institute is? Yep, so the BII is a non-profit translational research institute. Our purpose here is to translate the science that's out in the world that never actually gets spun out and makes it into a product. So as a nonprofit, we're dedicated to the mission of, of creating products for the benefit of people in society. And when we help that science become a product and get onto the market, that enables our mission of helping people in society. An important point about the BII is that we're actually funded by the Nova Nordisk Foundation with a grant of 470 million euros, which we put to work in uh, achieving our mission. It reminds me a little of other industries like music or writing where people have fantastic ideas, but they can't necessarily get those ideas to the commercial stage. This is kind of similar in so far as there are a lot of people and a lot of scientists that just can't bridge that gap. Yeah, and what I think is the counterintuitive principle that we work off of is that we believe that founders can actually be good startup leaders. And all of our programs are dedicated to helping founders in that spin-out process, not just to spin out the technology, but also to spin out themselves as leaders. And we train them to actually do that and be successful in fundraising and to continue in their companies that they spin out. When it comes to companies that you work with, do you have criteria for finding them? How do you go about the process? So in this, in our startup programs, we run open calls. And what we're looking for in our applications are projects that we believe with the help of BII and our funding can actually be fundable at the end of the program. So there's a lot of great science out there. There's a lot of great unmet need but not all projects are actually fundable by the venture capital community. So we're specifically looking for those projects that can be fundable post BII. Um, so our selection criteria are very much based on how engaged is the founder team? How good is the science? What does our advisory group, which consists of experts and venture capitalists, how do they view the fundability of these projects? When it comes to the projects, how involved do you get with the companies once you start with them? So we have two sets of programs. One is our venture program, which is very much based on convertible loans. But we also have our bio studio program, which are grants where we run the projects at the BII. But I think the most important part of our, about our loans is that we don't consider these investments. We consider this financial support for founders to get them started. And the point of having the loan is that it provides a platform which we start a company. So it makes clear to the founder that this is no longer an academic project, but it is part of a company and this is the path that we're on. So let's call it a halfway house between the university and their hopefully funded company. We're very involved in those companies. So the business development team here at the BII is involved in those companies. Each of those projects or companies has one of our team members as part of the team, essentially, working to help them improve their business plan, hire the right people, and pitch to investors so that they can raise money. Is that often a difficult transition for some people? Because they're obviously, some of them are based in academia, and then all of a sudden they're in a different world entirely. And that's exactly the challenge. So what the BD team or what the BII team tries to do with the founders is help them on their mindset. So we know that they can be successful because we've seen it in the past. And pretty much the limiting factor in their success is their own ability to understand the new environment they're working in and to adapt to it. So I typically tell the new companies when they join us that all the founders are absolutely critical for success but also insufficient and that more help is required and their primary job is to find that help and figure out what they need to be successful. I guess with a lot of some of the venture capitals and some companies that 
need funding that ends up leading to somebody being installed as a CEO that might be from a business background? I mean, do, do you encourage that or is that, or do you prefer to see the people that have the ideas run them? But we prefer the right people to run the company and, and that can change from company to company. What we do with the founders is when they start their company, we encourage them. We actually almost require them to hire a chair, an external chairperson who has experience in fundraising and in industry. And that chair should also be a mentor to this uh, new CEO. We also advise them as they get funded, the situations change and they may no longer be CEO. But that's also OK because they're still founder. They're still potentially chief scientific officer and they're still absolutely required for success. It's just part of that process of bringing on new people with other skills in order for the whole company to be successful. How many companies would you work with on average in a year across the different programs? So right now we have 50 companies in our venture program at different stages of the program, some under actively in the program, some post program in the fundraising phase. And we're bringing on 20 new companies a year now into the BII. We're going to bring in five new BioStudio projects in the coming 12 months into the BII. And what are those BioStudio projects? Could you explain what those are? Of course. So the BioStudio projects are these projects where we at the BII incubate an academic project with professors all over the world, a specific translational research project that we hope to spin out as a company at the end of the project. So we recently brought in a project from EMBO, for example, we have a project from Danish Cancer Society, and we're bringing on a project from uh, the Baker Lab at University of Washington in Seattle. And the most important part of the BioStudio program is that we staff the project. So BII employees staff the project and run the project here at the BII. What we're finding is it is important to take some of these projects out of the academic laboratory and run it at an institute like ours. So we have the right mindset around why we're doing this. So when we run these projects, they're on three-year grants for the sole purpose of establishing proof of concept and spinning out a company. Obviously, you've been doing this for a while. Could you share any success stories? So I think uh, if we look at just size of financing, our largest financing, so we use financing as a surrogate marker of success. Our mission is to benefit people in society, but that's a long-term objective and hard to measure. So in the, in, in the interim, financing works. So if we look at Adicendo, it's one of our companies uh, in the antibody drug conjugate space. They recently raised 50 million euros from an international syndicate of investors. We have our first license, large licensing deal from one of our companies. So that's Circle Biomedical, who has a non-hormonal contraceptive, which recently uh, signed a deal with Organon, $350 million uh, license deal, which now funds them to bring that project forward into the clinic. We also work in the uh, bioindustrial space. So we have a company called Chromologics that works on novel food colorants coming from a fermentation process. They raised up to 13 million euros uh, recently to fund their project. And, and so these are the largest numbers, but what we know in average companies at the BII raise on average four times the amount of financing that we provide them. And they raise that at a valuation that's seven times the amount of money that we provide. And um, what it shows is that there's a very long tail of companies that are raising smaller amounts of funding as they go and coming closer and closer to the market. You've had several press releases in, I would guess, the last six weeks or so. Could you give me some details on some of the, um, the new projects that you've helped? Yeah, so we're recently brought on uh, three companies, three international companies into the BII. So this is Vail, Myopax, and Sevenless. So Vail, for example, is a Finnish health tech company working to anonymize clinical data so that they can be used for analysis. Myopax is a, a company in Berlin focused on stem cells for the treatment of muscle disorders. And Sevenless is a company from the UK focused on the treatment of pain, creating compounds against a novel target. And I think what they all have in common were that all of these companies were very early in their development. We're in this stage where it's very difficult to raise financing from the typical VC industry, but yet we saw potential that they could actually get there and are helping to bridge that gap. 
In addition, we brought on today just another eight companies into our Venture Lab cohort, mostly Danish, but also some international companies. And I think the newest addition to our community here is we're starting to work with Novo Nordisk in helping them become more entrepreneurial and innovative with their own pipeline. So we will now be incubating two projects from Novo Nordisk in the Venture Lab so that those scientists can learn the entrepreneurial mindset and advance those projects at the BII. And what's the new Venture House program that you have? So the Venture House program is a new follow-on program for the Venture Lab program. So the Venture Lab provides approximately half a million euros of financing. It's a 12 month program where founders are also undergo intensive training, both business training and leadership training. And then for those that are doing exceptionally well, we have the possibility to fund them with another million and a half euros of financing in the Venture House program. That's an 18 month program where the educational component will be to really help them raise financing on the market. Some of the companies that you mentioned earlier, are are those companies that are in the Venture House program or are are there different companies that that funding is helping? We do have the first cohort of venture house companies, and I think I would point to, for example, a company like Evodia, which is fermenting compounds that basically taste like hops that you would use in beer. Non-alcoholic beer, when you remove the alcohol to create non-alcoholic beer, you also remove the hops and all the flavor as well. So Evodia is able to ferment compounds that have that hops flavor and put it back into the beer. They were in our Venture Lab program, and now they've also received uh, funding for Venture House. A lot of varied companies as well. It's not just um, not just a very narrow niche that you're working yeah. with here. Yeah, because we work in therapeutics, and typically in therapeutics, we, we have companies in the oncology and rare disease space. So these are areas where venture funds are typically interested. But we also in therapeutics have uh, a collaboration with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, to try and fund activities in the women's health space based on the understanding that 50% of the world's population is essentially underserved. Their medical needs are underserved. And we believe there is actual commercial potential here that industry and and VC industry will soon tune into. We also work in what we call planetary health. So planetary health is essentially any process that improves our sustainability on this planet. So that's carbon capture, food tech, agricultural technology, or any bioindustrial process that can replace a chemical process that's not sustainable. And that's a growing part of our business. And the third part is health tech. So basically digital solutions to improve human health. And we started that later and that's continuing to grow. So I guess it's just a case of keeping on going with what you're doing at the moment then. Exactly. We've reached critical mass on the therapeutics part of the business. So there we have a a large portfolio to share with the VC industry, lots of attention to our portfolio and a systematic way of sharing our portfolio with and our founders and introducing our founders to the VC industry. We're now expanding that into bioindustrials because our portfolio there has reached critical mass. And I imagine in the next two years, we'll do the same in the health tech practice as well. So is it just kind of like a, a circle where they come out one end and then you add more at the beginning? Yeah, our role here is to bridge that gap and then get the companies funded and hopefully they will grow and hopefully they'll grow within our ecosystem. And as long as we have funding and very generous funding from the Novo Nordisk Foundation and we can see that we're able to successfully incubate and get these companies financed, we'll continue to bring in new new companies and scale the approach. An interesting way to think about this is we have 470 million euros from the foundation and we're using that in 1 million euro batches. That's a lot of companies that we need to bring in and incubate. But each of those companies, if they're also able to raise on average four times the amount of money, you know, we could be bringing 1.6 billion euros into the local ecosystem here. So that's part of the reason the foundation established the BII. Uh, was also to to benefit the local ecosystem in Denmark. I think, importantly, this is the idea that founders can be good startup leaders. That's maybe the most controversial thing we think about here, because historically, when VCs meet founders, 
they're met with a complex set of psychology and challenges and what do I do with this founder, even if I love the science. And that's essentially the problem we're trying to solve here by getting the founders to be trained and select the ones with the right mindset. I think there's latent potential in the academic world that isn't being used to create startups. And our data so far show that that is possible. And so I'm really looking forward to seeing how we can scale that. There are already Christmas products in the stores here in the UK, but tis not only that season. It's also the season for events to kick off again, especially now the COVID threat seems to have lessened, at least for now. One event that caught my eye is the IASP's World Conference on Science Parks and Areas of Innovation, which is about to take place in Seville in Spain from September the 27th to the 30th. To tell us all about what seems like a fascinating event is Harriet Edwards, International Association of Science Parks Media and Community Manager. All right, thanks a lot for joining us today. I wonder if you could first give us a bit of background on the IASP. Sure. We're uh, an international association of science parks. Firstly, people tend to ask what a science park even is. These are organizations that support small and growing businesses, especially tech and science-based ones. And what we do is bring together science parks around the world so we can increase their visibility, we can tell the wider world what it is that they do, put them in touch with each other so that they can support their companies on an international level. So if you have a small company looking to take itself to international markets, one really good way to help them do that is to put them in touch with a science park who you know in the country where they're looking to expand so that they can get to know their local market and have a sort of base to start operations. And we've got around 350 members in 77 different countries worldwide and uh, through the International Board of Directors and branch office in Beijing and China. And our world headquarters are here in Malaga in Spain. You don't really realize that there are that many countries with science parks. Is, Is the content of the science parks very different? Yes and no. That there's obviously there are some who specialize that some are purely IT parks. Clearly, that's you know one of the biggest sectors. So some people have chosen to focus uniquely on that. And in countries that you perhaps you wouldn't be the ones you first think of, and we were involved recently in a uh, project in Tajikistan giving advice on how they might go about setting up an ICT park there because it's been recognized as a a mechanism for economic development. A couple in who spe- others who specialize in life sciences some with more sort of niche sectors of specialization like mobility sector, self-driving vehicles. So it depends. They're run in quite similar ways, but the sectors can be extremely different. And then we do obviously have worldwide a lot who are fairly generalist that they'll accept any innovative company pretty much because they can give support across sectors. Yeah, it sounds interesting when you mention countries like Tajikistan. They, mm. they, they're not really areas that you would necessarily think of, I guess. But does that mean that you're dealing with a lot of established ones? You're also helping at the other end of the scale? Absolutely. With- absolutely. And in fact, we find they often have a lot to learn from each other. Like More logically, the new parks are learning from mature parks in places like, obviously, the US is where most of us think of science parks as having started sort of this idea of Silicon Valley as a place that lots of really bright, new, innovative companies in the tech industry developed. But they're not just in the US, they spread throughout Europe. There's a very strong science park movement in Brazil, in China. China does its uh, slightly different structures and they tend to, to make much bigger parks and then branch out from one single model, but it's they're doing the same kind of work. India, as we know, is has a growing tech sector and its life sciences sector is pretty strong as well. So we've got growing numbers of parks in India and Pakistan. We've also got some interesting locations that we've found them in, as in our, perhaps our most unique location is a new science park in space, which is based on the International Space Station. And so they're opening that up for companies who want to do low Earth orbit research, the George Washington Carver Space Station, that's called. Um, so that's certainly a, a first for us to find a park in space. But what others have done is also made a story of industrial renewal and city district renewal. So we've got a couple based in London. There's here East based in the former Olympic Park. So that's a sort of interesting reuse of that huge site there in the old media centre and they've turned that into an sort of innovation campus. Same kind of work going on just outside Milan in the Expo Milan. That site's being redeveloped into an, what they call an innovation district. Another one will be done on the site of Dubai 2020. They're also going to be adjusting the, the building so that they can use that as a science park or area of innovation. 
So we've got really some quite interesting locations that I think you wouldn't necessarily think that's where we're going to find science parks, but people have uh, had some very creative approaches to infrastructure and perhaps former industrial sites that are in decline or have already declined and now getting a new lease of life by being refurbished and totally redone. Is there a bit of a trade-off between, you mentioned all of those places that you mentioned are big cities where I mm. imagine prices are high and also you can't expand very much in a place mm. like London, whereas if you were to go to, I don't know, a, a small community where land is cheaper and they can grow, is there a bit of a trade-off there? There is. We, we do also find that model, but there's some built on just where we are here in Malaga. The park's been up and running for 30 odd years now, uh, and it's outside the city centre on some land that there, I think some of it was agricultural, but there just wasn't much here beforehand. So they picked their out of the city centre site and they've now got 20,000 people working here. And we see others that have chosen a, a similar model. So I think it's always about the accessibility as well, that you have to be able to get people to and from your site. But if you move out just outside the city centre, often you can take advantage of everything that you've got, a pool of talent from the city, often a university, and that's a pillar that nearly all of our parks have some kind of university involvement. Um, But of course, yeah, if you go slightly outside, you do get that advantage of uh, more room to expand and cheaper land, but you do want those connections with your city. And that is something that we've seen as a continued trend that's even strengthening, that parks are really involved in their local cities. They have close links with the local authorities, with the city mayor, and they're very much involved in the economic life of their city. Do you help with things like the economics of things, like helping between companies and cities, municipalities, that kind of thing? Us directly, not so much, because while we're trying to connect the parks, what we can't be is expert in every individual city and the local politics and how they work. So what we try to do is share examples of best practice so that if people have a great initiative that help them get in touch with this section of their community or that help them develop talent in a particular sector that the market's really calling out for, then we'll share that best practice with the rest of our members. But more direct involvement, we think that the people there on the ground have the local knowledge and they're the ones who are telling us how they've done it and we want to know about it, but we don't necessarily get directly financially or directly involved in how they do it, no. Sure. I guess the uh, important news at the moment is the World Conference. Mm-hmm. If you could tell me a little bit about that, you know, what's the uh, reasoning behind it and the detail? Sure. Well, the extreme weather and climate change, our conference is focusing this year on green and digital change and what science parks are doing to sort of lead the conversation and the new technologies that they're helping to develop because science parks are places, of course, where new technology, innovation, new discoveries are being developed. And so the hope is that this is where we're going to find solutions to some of the problems we're facing globally about the climate. And so our conference is taking place in Seville in Spain at the end of September from the 27th to the 30th. And that's what the main theme will be. We'll be speaking about sustainability, what science parks are doing, how they themselves can run as sustainable organisations, as in their buildings, their infrastructure, reducing car use, anything that an organization can do, they're telling us what they do. And then also telling us about what their companies are doing and the new tech that they may be working on. And then next level is the structures that they're putting in place to help green companies to get off the ground, help the person with a brilliant new idea get going, help their companies run as sustainable businesses, even if green isn't their core business. So it's a conversation all around the ways that science parks are contributing, both internally and externally, if you will, all in uh, beautiful Seville, which I think we're all really looking forward to getting a, a glimpse of the history and the culture and the food as well. So we're hoping to get several hundred people from science parks, from companies joining us there to join that conversation. You know, it's obviously well known for its oranges, and I it picked is. one. I picked one from a tree. It was the sourest thing. I yeah. ever, it took about two days before I, could, I couldn't taste it. That's my lasting memory of Seville. They are famously very, very sour. It's true. Yeah, they're, they're for marmalade, ideally, aren't they? But uh, I'm British originally, and here living in in Spain, it's something I can't get over. Just seeing oranges growing on the trees, just there in the street. Yeah, so well, I think we'll we'll be able to offer that to our delegates at Seville as well as uh, obviously they'll get to know as well as the city itself and everything that you might see as a tourist. They'll also get to have a bit of an insight into what we call the, the innovation ecosystem, how the small companies are being supported there where our local host 
is uh, based in Cartuja, which in fact was another one of those examples of a park that was a universal expo. So it was Seville 92 and the science park there was used that reused the buildings and the, the site there. And they're running it as very much a, a sustainable city district. So they're going car free fairly shortly. They've got lots of sustainable energy projects going on. So the, uh, delegates to the conference will also get a bit of an insight into that. I think that if you just visit Seville as a tourist, perhaps that's the side you're not going to see. Does it rotate around cities and uh, is it every year or is it every year? It does. Every it's year? every year. The last two years, as you can imagine, we haven't been able to meet in person because our, our network is completely global. So there was... There was no, and there was nowhere in the world that was spared really from COVID. So we had two online events, which were fantastic as a way of keeping in touch. But I think everyone agrees it's not the same as meeting in person. You don't get to discover a new place. You don't get to just bump into somebody over coffee. So yeah, previous years, we've been really all around the world. The last one we had in person was in Western France in Nantes. The previous year in Iran, in Isfahan, in Istanbul, Turkey, in Moscow, in China, We've been to Qatar, we've been to Recife in Brazil. So yeah, really a very much uh, worldwide destinations, which are chosen because they have a, an interesting innovation story to tell and a local host who wants to introduce their city and their region to the world and showcase everything that they're doing. Sounds interesting. Has it sort of evolved and grown over the years? It's grown, uh, yeah, in numbers we're, we're seeing more people joining us. But really, I think it's a model that we've kept quite stable that we found this is a, a successful way of introducing, of being a global network. We find that that model is quite important, that we should be in a different city and ideally even a different continent where possible, just to make sure that what, we're not just focusing on one region or one part of the world, that we're really seeing the story everywhere. Um, and for example, next year, our members will be choosing between Quebec City in Canada and uh, Nairobi in Kenya. So two vastly different destinations for the both really got a story to tell and want to showcase what's happening where they are. So it'll be interesting to find out which it's our members who will decide in a vote during this coming conference. So we'll, we'll be able to report back in a few weeks on where we'll be heading in 2024. And as far as the event itself, is it mostly um, like presentations or conference setting? Yeah, mostly presentations. We were trying this year to bring in some slightly more interactive formats, make sure that there's always space at the end of short presentations and then a bit of a breakout time with the speakers in a more of a panel rather than straight up one question, one answer. Get just a little bit of discussion going because we find you get the more most interesting conversations sometimes comes out between your speakers who are experts in related but slightly different aspects and so when we get them in conversation we get something really interesting going on we're also having sort of little focus talks where someone hones in on one particular issue and we always wanted our, our audiences to be participating but I think we it would still be fair to say that it's mostly presentation based that that's the the bare bones of it and then we get people more involved as much as we can. And who is it aimed at? I mean, who will be attending? Largely the people we're really reaching out to are the managers and management teams of science parks and areas of innovation anywhere in the world. But as well as them, it's interesting for academics, chambers of commerce, uh, economic development agencies of, of all sorts. Uh, anyone who's on that cusp of how to turn research into business, how a sort of new invention or new solution can be taken to the market. So anyone from that kind of world, we get along with us, we get some researchers and we do get some of the companies joining us too, that there's often a couple of representatives from big corporates who want to see that we are, who recognize that the science parks are the gateways to these tiny companies who have brilliant ideas that it's quite hard to find out about. Our audience knows who those companies are. So anyone who's sort of interested in tapping into that world often joins us. And as well as sort of people who give advice to bigger companies or small ones on where they might base themselves as in science parks are clearly a tempting location for some and so people who want to know about that so how many people do you traditionally get uh seven eight hundred we've had years when we've been uh one i think one thousand three hundred i think i'm right in saying was, was our biggest a few years ago so it fluctuates sometimes people have said no we want to make this small and intimate 
think we were in Tallinn 10 years ago and they said, no, we'd like it to keep it small. Estonia being a small country, that seemed appropriate, but you get a, really, a different kind of atmosphere and maybe easier interaction if it's a smaller group. And other places have wanted to go big and bring in as many of their sort of local partners as they can, as well as the global audience. So that really depends. But the seven, eight hundred is about our, our average, let's say. And I, I assume from right across the world. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I know this year we've got a big delegation coming from Thailand, another fairly big one from Brazil, Portugal. Uh, unfortunately, travel, there's still some COVID travel restrictions, which meant most of our Chinese colleagues can't join us. And But normally we, we're pleased to have a, quite a big group from China. Always there's a strong science park industry there. And that China is this huge market. But obviously a lot of people are quite interested as well to, to learn more about how they do things there. So yeah, totally global. We've got, I think, seven, usually at least 70 nationalities uh, represented in our delegates and speakers. No, it sounds like a great event. It sounds like it's going to be a really good one. And then I guess you start on the next one. Exactly, yeah. Next year we're in Luxembourg, which is another one with an interesting story that I guess perhaps Luxembourg is in the country that people know very well, other than its image, uh, you know, right in the heart of Europe. But the local host for next year is an incubator called Technoport. And they're based in this former industrial steelworks. And I didn't know that Luxembourg was you know, the, 100 years ago was really leading the way in the industrial revolution in their um, in their steel production. Obviously, gradually that declined in importance. And then for a few years, they had these, these districts sitting there with nothing. And now the incubator is based there, sort of turning that former industrial wasteland, if you like, into this really architecturally fascinating. And they're doing this great work supporting new up and coming companies. And they'll be see, hosting our event, sort of bring international attention to Luxembourg as they try and push this innovation and knowledge economy, looking to their future. Is there anything else that you wanted to promote? Well, I suppose just a, a last mention. I know we said we'll be discovering sort of the history and culture of, of Seville, but that really is very much part of what these conferences are about. So as well as the work aspects, we do some ni- really nice social events, like one's going to be in a, a navigation museum where... Magellan and the two Spanish explorers who first circumnavigated the globe set out from Seville and they returned exactly 500 years ago and we thought that that was a really nice connection to our global network these guys went all around the world and we are bringing people from all around the world to Seville so we'll be sort of looking back on the history of the city but people will also get this exclusive location for their social events that you again you don't necessarily get to visit if you're there independently and it's also the first time that our network has been together since 2019 so we're really looking forward to getting back to these in-person events and actually being able to socialize rather than you know little video chats on zoom can be they fill the gap but i think everyone Mm -hmm. agrees it's not quite the same as sitting next to someone at dinner and uh, seeing something amazing about a country you've never been to before I won't be at that event, but hopefully next year I will be at the one in Luxembourg. After the interview, Harriet sent me some facts on the organisation and the members, and it was really fascinating to see some of the science parks in places you'd not imagine, like Panama and Andorra. And now it's time for our weekly chat with global commercial real estate services company JLL, and this week it's with Travis McReady. Hi Travis, what have you got for us this week? Hey Jim, and great to be here, and welcome back from the summer. Quite a bit of activity in the life sciences over the summer months, and certainly one thing that stood out to me was the number and diversity of large transactions involving big pharma and artificial intelligence providers to uh, accelerate drug discovery. As you know, after some fits and starts in the early 20-teens, AIML has grown to be a mainstay of enabling technologies for drug developers. It really allows researchers unprecedented computational ability to process structural biological information. Using AIML research, you can scan large libraries of potential drug candidates for disease targets in the blink of an eye. You can also reduce the need for extensive preclinical trials in using animals, at least which is a a true boon to contract research organizations, and it will speed up the time it takes for potential drug candidates to reach the clinic, which is particularly important for conditions where no treatment currently exists. 
Because of this efficiency potential, large pharma has been lining up to engage in multi-billion dollar engagements with um, AI providers like Accentia, Atomwise, and Silico Medicine. There are about a half a dozen or so of them. One example a few weeks ago that I found particularly exciting was Sanofi entering into a $1.2 billion pact with AI service provider Atomwise to search for drug targets against the company's library of 3 trillion synthesizable compounds. This deal actually complements a couple of other pre-existing uh, multi-billion dollar pacts with AI providers, uh, Accentia and Alkin, which combined Sanofi believes has the possibility of cutting its drug development process by not days or months, but by years. So what's the size of the market? The overall AI service provider market for pharma, biotech, and healthcare is uh, forecast to be about $21 billion. Um, that's using data we pull from global data. And it's growing at a CAGR of about 24% a year. Yes, it is early days for this tech. Um, as of right now, there are over 500 unique drugs that have been discovered by AI platforms, but only a paltry few have made their way into and through clinical trials. And my anticipation is with that type of large-scale investment coming from firms like Sanofi and others, you can expect that number to increase rapidly over time. Naturally, here at JLL, we're watching the growth of this industry closely. Not only does AIML signal pharma's need for a different skill set in drug discovery, which has the downstream effect of improving the attractiveness of certain regions where this computer science talent can be found in abundance, it also signals the extended life of small molecule pathways towards drug discovery. Uh, not everything is about cell and gene therapies and the ongoing demand for this type of R&D lab space uh, worldwide. So exciting times, certainly an area to watch, uh, certainly something that I'm watching, and to me, a hallmark of the types of transactions we saw over the summer. With that, back to you, Jim. Great. Thank you, Travis. Look forward to talking to you again next week. Travis McReady is the leader of JLL's Life Science Markets Advisory Practice in the Americas, working closely with the global and scaling life sciences companies, developers, and investors to achieve breakthroughs. He has more than 25 years of experience spearheading successful ventures related to technology and innovation, including as president and CEO of a $1.6 billion life sciences funding agency. And that does it for another show. Next week, the plan is to do a preview of NLS Days, which is coming up in Sweden at the end of the month, and we will be there, so please do get in touch if you will be as well. Seems like it's going to be a huge event and that there will be plenty of interview opportunities. I'm looking forward to it, even if I'm not looking forward to getting up before 4am. I must also remember my passport. In fact, maybe I'll go grab that now and put it in the flight bag, as long as I take the right flight bag. I'll also get back to all of the news that's coming in, plus I have an interview to do later today for next week's podcast. It never ends, which is probably a good thing. And so wherever in the world you may be, I hope you have a great week ahead. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll join us again here at LaBiotech next time for another Beyond Biotech.